Biblical end times are long past, nearly 2,000 years in the past. There has been a financial incentive to convince the Christian community to believe otherwise. This message is not racist, and it contains points based on logic seldom heard. It seems most Jewish people are just as ignorant about their history being negatively affected by the Talmud as our most Christians are about the basic teachings of Jesus Christ. This material usually comes from racists, though they might refer almost exclusively to Talmudistic influenced Jewish elitists. They use a broad brush and associate it with all Jews. In addition to that, some use ugly graphics that supposedly portray Jewish facial features and by doing so prove they are white racists. I present this message about basic Christianity for these reasons. One, to point out how good in-depth research into history has been undermined by racism. Two, how Christians are very misinformed because they have been turned off by that racism and have also been taught doctrines that are directly influenced by the Talmud. Note, John Calvin and Martin Luther were also influenced by Talmudistic Gnosticism. Again, biblical end times are past. The day of the Lord arrived in several phases and they all happened in the last days. One, Christ's birth and ministry. Two, his death, burial, and resurrection. Three, Pentecost and persecution of the church. That was the great tribulation. Four, the total destruction of Israel beginning in 68 A.D. The last days involved that first century generation. Christ did not know the exact hour or even the day of his return, but he did know it would come to pass in that generation and knew the wrath of God was to soon be poured out on rebellious Israel. And he went into detail as to why in the 23rd chapter of Matthew. He also gave instructions to his followers in chapter 24 as what to look for so they would be forewarned and able to escape. When there was a break in the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman army, those who believed what Christ had said left, and that is the forceful deliverance mentioned in the following passages. And because lawlessness shall be multiplied, the allegiance of many shall grow cold, but he who endures to the end the same shall be rescued or be saved in other versions Matthew 24 12 to 13 when therefore you plural see the detestable thing of desolation which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the special place let him who reads understand then let those that are in Judea flee to the mountain Matthew 24, 15 to 16. He, in effect, told them not to walk, but to run and get out of there. The next passage clearly tells us the dead were already with the Lord. I do so hope and pray that you will accept that and not keep telling people they are all in their graves until sometime in the future. We believe that Jesus died, but we also believe that he rose again. So we believe that God will have already raised to life through Jesus any who have died and bring them together with him when he comes. 
What we tell you now is the Lord's own message. Those of us who are still living when the Lord comes again will join him, but not before those who have already died. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a cloud, loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the people who have died and were in Christ will have risen first. After that, we who are still alive at that time will be gathered up with those who have died. We will be taken up in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. That's First Thessalonians 4, 14 and 18. And that's my paraphrase. I'm doing my best to get at the intent. Now study first century history and hear that trumpet blowing nearly 2,000 years ago. Here are excerpts that back up those paraphrased passages. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. As Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44. He goes on, he says, Being therefore always bold and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord's home. For we walk by trust, not by sight. We are bold, I say, and are willing rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. That's every Christian's hope. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. Now this is based on the Bible. The children of Israel were never all completely carried away captives. The nations that conquered Israel usually took the best of them for slaves and left some to care for the land. As a result, Palestine has always had some religious Jews living there. Now, religious Pharisees were into proselyting all over the Roman Empire even before the time of Christ. They were the descendants of those rebellious religious Jews who had created an oral Talmud as a way to pacify their carnality many years before Christ was born. A high-ranking Jewish rabbi has said that the tradition of the elders that Jesus mentioned was their Talmud. But that fact seems to be completely unknown to most Christian theologians. Now this is from the Old Testament. Some of the Israelites in outlying areas also escaped by running into the mountains. In this case, the poor, who had nothing to lose, were allowed to stay. But Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, left of the poor of the people, which had nothing, in the land of Judah, and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. That's Jeremiah 39.10. Uh, but the captain of the guard left of the poor of the land to be vine dressers and husbandmen. That's 2 Kings 25, 12. And it's also said again in Jeremiah 52, 16. Well, there are also scholarly debates about this. Some of those investigating this are Israelis, and there are at least three studies and three opposing sides, if not more. One, Jewish DNA of the European Jews who are the majority in Israel via immigration. Two, the foundational reason for the return of the Jews to a land that God had promised to them. Three, is there any record of all of the Jews in Israel being carried off by the Romans in the first century? Four, does the New Testament support Zionism?
The thought that they were to return after having been carried off by the Romans is a myth. Many had returned from everywhere earlier, and again, more than one Israeli historian has said, today's nation of Israel is based on a myth. Ah, oh, listen to this. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold, more the child of hell than yourselves. And that's what Christ said in Matthew 23, 15. And note, Herod had the second temple completely tore down, and the one he built was the third temple, and was not a remodeling of the second temple. This is an accurate assessment. The nation of Israel has nothing to do with God. Now this is from a note posted on Christian News in volume 07 and number 26 and that's 7 1974. God did promise the land of Canaan to the seed of Abraham, but surely not all not to all the physical offspring. The Bible says that the real offspring are those Jews who believed in the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, and not to the nation of Israel. It is beyond me how any knowledgeable Christian can even think that the present state of Israel would in any way fit the description of God's people. Ben Gurion was a Buddhist, Golden Meir, a Marxist Zionist, no one in the government is a, Christian, is a Christian or even an Old Testament follower, follower of Jehovah. All these leaders are dedicated to the Zionist case of controlling the world. About the best one can call them is humanists, but in no way followers of any god. And I added, the Talmud also say they are to rule the world. And that was said way before Muslims come along and picked up that thought for themselves. The initial followers of Jesus were Israelites, not Gentiles, and were the promised righteous remnant. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled and said, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And yet we hear them speaking in our own languages? From where were we were born? Now strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we hear them speaking in all our languages the wonderful works of God. That's just from Acts chapter 2, the 5 to 11. Now, Christ chose some Galileans as his disciples. That's in Matthew 4, 15 to 19. Christ is quoted as saying several times that neither he nor his kingdom were of this world. In John, the 14th chapter, he detailed what was to soon happen, and though his righteous followers were to see him soon, the world would never see him again. He told Judas that he and his father would come to them and dwell with them. He was specifically telling his close followers about this and made sure they would understand, for he repeated it. God told several of Christ's followers on the Mount of Transfiguration they were to listen to his son. Even though they had seen Moses and Elijah, they're talking with Christ. But most build their second coming doctrines on the Old Testament. Christ's ministry was described to his mother before he was born. In a sense, his ministry began even before he was born, and his relatives were informed that he would also be a light to the Gentiles, 
And they knew he was to be the king of righteous Israelites. The Beatitudes were foundation to his, foundational to his ministry, but before that, both he and John the Baptist had called Israel to repentance, for their king had arrived, and his kingdom was within reach, and it could be both seen and entered by those who repented and were baptized. That was what Christ was telling Nicodemus in John 3, and that was the good news. For the Messiah had come and established his kingdom. The following are all inseparable and are all one and the same. God's kingdom, Christ's kingdom, Mount Zion, the city of the living God, and the heavenly Jerusalem. Born-again Christians have arrived and are in Christ, and He and His Father are dwelling with and in them. However, Christ foresaw a problem and mentioned it when He was telling the story of the widow and the unjust judge. He said, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried, cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? That's Luke eighteen sixty eight. He did avenge him speedily in 70 A.D. Theologians note a period of silence following the destruction of Israel. There was a great falling away before that happened, and Christ foresaw the approaching faithlessness that created that silence. All down through the history of God's dealings with His people, there were only a small righteous group, and it is referred to as a remnant, but He promised to always have them. Even Christ spoke of a small flock who would be given the kingdom. There's little in the way of secular history supporting the Old Testament, and the absence of any writings by many of the early church fathers is in keeping with that. In addition, there is almost nothing in their writings about the present reality of Christ's in-heart kingdom fulfilling His prophecy as per John 14 or as being the good news that both John the Baptist and he had proclaimed. That being Israel's final king had arrived. God's wrath avenged his persecuted saints, and that was the last phase of the day of the Lord. The Jewish historian Josephus describes what happened to the temple in Jerusalem, and that destruction was the end of that old mosaic system of worship, and that was trumpeted all over the world. It was also seen. It says the destruction was solid evidence of things not seen and of the integrity of both Christ's and Old Testament prophecies, but not proof. Talmudism has, had already been infecting Christian end-time doctrine, and many believe Christ did not finish His ministry, for wolves were not laying down with lambs. To them that meant He still must return again in a bodily form and sit on an earthly throne. That is Talmudism. However, Christians were delivered and definitely lifted up and have since been entering Zion for nearly 2,000 years. They were lifted up and glorified before the world. That's because what Christ had said happened. Christ finished his ministry. He had finished his ministry to the Israelites before he was killed. He said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. 
I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. That's John 17, that's 4 to 6, and that's when he's praying. It would be wonderful if Christians would just believe what Christ said. Many Israelis followed Christ for a while. However, all of his words had not fallen on good ground. Two, some had believed and turned away from their sins for a while. Three, however, many had then turned back like dogs to the vomit. Four, they had been cleansed but not filled. And when the enemy was out looking for a place to inhabit and found their empty vessels, he invited his wicked friends. And those unbelieving Israelites Israel's end was worse than it had been before. There was to be a great falling away, and it happened. Six, five, the unbelieving Israelites went crazy and tried to kick the Romans out. Six, all of that proved that Christ had finished his work, for they had created their own destruction by rejecting him. Apostle Paul knew believers had come to Mount Zion, but he did not live to see the final phase. He said, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. That's Hebrews 12, 24 People want to know about that Jerusalem, that new heaven and earth. But right there, Paul says, You are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Christ unsealed Daniel's prophecy and John said he had seen the new Jerusalem coming down. That was all said nearly 2,000 years ago, but John heard more of that clinched the thought, for Christ had finished his earthly ministry. This is in Revelation. He said, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's Revelation 21, 3. Now ask yourself this. Is God's tabernacle here in the now? And is he dwelling with us? Please say yes. There's a lot of present tense statements in the book of Revelation. Again, the last days came in several phases, leading up to the final day of the Lord. John the Baptist was a godly man, but he did not partake in the greater blessings arriving in Christ's kingdom that we have received since Pentecost. Christ's immediate, immediate followers received that infilling, but then went through terrible tribulation, and those who were killed were waiting under the altar for their blood to be avenged. That's in Revelation 6, 9 to 10. That was to happen when the temple, Jerusalem, and the nation of Israel were all completely destroyed and removed from the Roman maps following 70 AD. That destruction both avenged the martyrs and released them from their graves along with all other God of people and places the foretelling of that before 70 AD. Now, no Jerusalem, no Israel for 200 years or more, actually. And they, these are maps from that period of time. And you can stop this video if you want to and check them out. You won't find Israel on there. You won't find Jerusalem. 
so see if you can uh, check them things out. The world will never be destroyed, neither will the heavens. The temple and its form of worship represented the heavens and earth. The holies represented heaven, while the outer area represented the world. Josephus' history mentions that. Godly Christians are walking on that highway of holiness, and they have went through that narrow gate, and they have also entered those gates of pearl. Now see if you can get that across or accept it. Now read the next sentence carefully. Yes, there will always be many wicked ones left outside who refuse to repent. However, there are still more blessings to come after we die, and as Stephen was being stoned, he got a glimpse of it. The world will have a tremendous change for the better when Christians consistently believe Christ. And it said, He that sat upon the throne said, now notice that it says, He that sat upon the throne. That's talking about something that was happening and had happened. Behold, I make all things new. The one sitting up upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He was enthroned. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is is done. All of that's present tense, and that's said 2,000 years ago, or nearly 2,000 years ago. He goes on, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. It's Revelation 21, 5 to 7. I've never heard that ministered and preached on. This is the end of this presentation. I hope it gets you thinking. I hope it blesses you.